our reading, our second reading from Thessalonians is a popular reading for funerals. I, I used it for my mother and my father's funeral. And, and, and I like it because St. Paul says, we don't want you to be unaware. By the way, you might want to read along with this. Um, uh, St. Paul says, we do not want you to be unaware. Why does he not want us to be unaware? And what does he want us to be aware of? He says, he doesn't want us to be unaware about those who have fallen asleep. Why? So that you may not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Please note, he doesn't say that you're not going to grieve. But he says, you don't want to grieve like those who have no hope. Because Jesus died and rose. And then, and so too, God, through Jesus will bring with him all those who have fallen asleep. And then if you go down almost to the end, the whole point of this is that, that we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds or in the sky or in heaven to meet the Lord in the air. Again, to, to meet him in heaven. So the whole point of this is what do we hope for? We hope for our salvation. We hope for our resurrection. And we know that it comes through Jesus. So we need to know Jesus. If you go to our first reading from the book of Wisdom, <clears throat> resplendent and unfading is wisdom. And she, and you say, oh, you know, maybe they're just kind of using she as you know, a, a form of speaking about wisdom. Wisdom is kind of this theoretical thing. But that's not the point. I, I think there is a good reason or argument for saying that she here is the Holy Spirit. Wisdom is an in, not, I can't say incarnation because the Holy Spirit doesn't have a body. But she, the Holy Spirit, is the wisdom of God. And so we're not talking about being smart or learning something. We're talking about knowing God. She is readily perceived by those who love her. The more we know God, the more we know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're going to love them more. And the more we love God, and here again, I, I don't know about you, but I don't usually pray to the Holy Spirit. Um, I usually think about God the Father or God the Son. And so this is a good time to, to remind ourselves that we want to know God. We want to love God. We have to know God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So she will be found by those who seek her. And this next part, man, if you got a pen, underline this line. She hastens to make herself known in anticipation of their desire. In other words, even before you want to know God, even, though, even before you, you have this desire, God is already, already charging at us. God is already running to help us. It's, it's like the father in the story of the prodigal son. He goes running to his son. For whoever watches for her will not be dis disappointed and will find her sitting by his gate. And then again, if you go down, you skip down to uh, the last line or two here. Because she makes her rounds seeking those who are worthy of her. We're going to talk about worthy in a second, but she's seeking. We often think of ourselves as, as trying to find God and, and trying to, to discover God, and it's actually the other way around. She, uh, she, the Holy Spirit, is seeking those worthy of her, 
And again, this is why you can see that this is not some kind of a, a thought process that's going on in my mind. This is actually God, all right? Seeking those who are worthy of her and graciously appears to them in the ways and meets them. Again, what was the point in our second reading? We are going to meet the Lord in the air. Thus, we shall always, again, we should underline that too, we shall always be with the Lord. And so we need to console one another with these words. So when, when uh, we think about the, the she here, the wisdom of God, um, God's plan is that he will meet with us, that we're going to be joined together. And of course, that is very, very clear in our gospel. Jesus says, or the uh, Matthew says that Jesus told a parable. And again, a, a, a parable is a story that's going to kind of explain something that might be a little bit complicated. And so the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, what is this going to be like? Well, imagine that a groom, a bridegroom, is away, and all of the, I, I guess we would say bridesmaids today, However, in your own life, don't read this as bridesmaids. God's plan for each and every one of us is not that we will be a bridesmaid, but that we will be the bride. Jesus is the groom. We are the bride. And so the kingdom of God is similar to when the bridegroom comes. It says all ten, they had their lamps with them. The foolish ones didn't bring oil. The wise ones did. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now, if you go down to the bottom, the last verse, it says, Therefore, stay awake. You do not know the, neither the uh, day nor the hour. Um, they all fell asleep. God knows that we're not perfect. He's in the process of perfecting us, but he's not going to throw us out because we make a mistake or through human weakness, we don't live up to all of the expectations. So even the wise virgin, virgins, they, they fall asleep. They come up short. But here's the thing. They have been actively collecting oil, if you will. And again, this is symbolic. What is that oil? Well, could be a life of good works. Um, I, I think on a, on a more basic level, that oil is our relationship with Jesus. And that's why the wise virg virg virgins say to the foolish, we can't give you any of our oil. I can't give to you a relationship with someone else. And here's the thing, you can't buy it either. Imagine a wedding feast. The groom is at the altar. The bride is processing up. Are we going to be ready? When we think of uh, the judgment at the end of time, Jesus says, I'm not going to be your judge. He's not going to be our judge in an earthly way. He's going to be our judge in this relationship. Are we worthy of him? Because what do the foolish virgins do? Instead of staying there and, and waiting for the bridegroom, they go off to try to get this oil somewhere else. And how this is such a problem, I think, with, with modern Christians. We are told that, oh, do this or oh, do that. 
and you know, you're going to gain wisdom or knowledge of God. God reveals himself in his word. God reveals himself in the Eucharist. God reveals himself in the community. So are we establishing a better relationship with God by reading the scriptures? Even if you read just a little bit every day, it's a good start. I saw a YouTube video on this guy who said, um, I'm going to do 100 push-ups a day. And when he started, he couldn't do five. So he did five. And later on in the day, he did another five. And then later on in the day, he did another five. And I think later on he did another five. He, in other words, he, he, he started with what he could do, and he built up. And after about two weeks, I think, he was doing 100 push-ups a day. And by the end of a month, he could do 100 push-ups all at one time. Well, God wants to be in a relationship with you. And if we start off, even with a little bit, we're going to grow in that relationship. Because here's the, the last thing is important. When the wedding feast comes, and, and that's what's going on in heaven, the wedding feast of the Lamb. When that comes, when the Lord comes to meet us again, we're going to meet the Lord in the sky in our second reading. Well, wisdom is coming to meet us in our first reading. When we get to heaven, we're going to meet the Lord face to face. And what will the Lord say? Will he welcome us in, or will he say, and this is like, again, underlying this one, this is one of the scariest, I think we read over this too quickly. Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Holy Toledo. Does God know me? I've been searching after God, and the truth is, God has been hastening to meet me. Do I cooperate with that? Now, if you'll indulge me for one more second, go back to our first reading from Wisdom. This reading starts in verse 12 of the sixth chapter. If you have a Catholic Bible, because this isn't in all Protestant Bibles, uh, Martin Luther decided that there were a few books in the Old Testament that shouldn't be there. But if you've got a Catholic Bible, and if you don't buy one, um, but if you go to Wisdom chapter 6, it starts like this. Hear, therefore, kings, and understand. Learn, you magistrates of the earth's expanse. How many kings or queens do we have here today? Thank you, a few of you who remember this. How many priests do we have here today? I, I see a lot of people going like this. How many prophets do we have here? If you've been baptized, please raise your hand all the way over your head. All right? By your baptism, God made you priest, prophet, and king. So when they speak in the Old Testament of kings and magistrates, give ear, you who have power over multitudes and lord it over throngs of people, because authority was given to you by the Lord and sovereignty by the Most High. We don't know ourselves. What chance is there for us to go before the Lord and be known by the Lord? If you think that you're going to the wedding feast of the Lamb as a bridesmaid or as a servant or as a slave or one thing that was kind of popular when I was growing up, Oh, the Blessed Mother will sneak you in the back door of heaven. I mean, oh my gosh, I scratch my head and say, that's terrible theology. 
Do you think the Blessed Mother is going to love you more than God? God wants us to be his bride. He wants to make us priests, prophets, kings, or queens. He wants us to be ruling over the world. He is giving us this authority, all right? This authority has been given to you by Almighty God, who shall probe your works and scrutinize your counsels. God wants us to know him so that we will know who we are. He wants us to know us so that we can meet him here on earth and in heaven. But we have to do our part. We have to be worthy of him. And so in the end, because by the way, we're the, coming to the end of the liturgical year. And so our readings are going to focus on the end. We're going to be going before the Lord. If we are like the ten foolish virgins, we're going to run away. We're not going to stay. God wants us to meet him. Even though we're imperfect, he wants us to know him and to trust him and to love him.